Zoom really because I knew the camera were good. Okay. Well, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us, our final presentation here. This evening we'll be discussing creeping red fescue and some of the parameters that go along with how to grow it, market it, and then use maps and stuff with that too. So this is a little bit different from the SMF presentation. We obviously did not grow any creeping red fescue. We have no experience with it. We were just interested in it, and that's why we decided to go along with it. Maybe the SMF, though, will consider planting some after we're done with this presentation. So this is a little bit of an overview, and then we'll go through and introduce ourselves. So I'm Ava Moeller. I'm from a grain farm outside of Killam, Alberta. I'm Keegan Paul. I'm from a mixed farm outside of Saxmouth, Alberta, and we'll be talking about soil health and plant pests. I'm Taryn Kangeser, and I grew up on a grain farm outside of Lacombe. I'm Raymond Paul, and I'm from Saxmouth, Alberta. I'm Brooklyn Callflesh, and I'm from a mixed farm near Lamont, Alberta, and we will be talking about production and agronomy. I'm Austin from uh, Moose Jaw, Saskatchewan, a grain farm, and we'll be talking about broadcast and fertilizer. Um, I'm Brooklyn Moore. I come from a mixed farm in Paradise Hill, Saskatchewan, and I'll be talking about grazing and feed. I'm Callie Metzi. I come from a cow-calf operation in Nestor Easy. I'm Chase Hanke. I come from a grain operation in Paradise Valley, Alberta, and we'll be talking about finance and marketing. Derek Chevro from Dome, Alberta. I come from a grain farm. I'm Carl Dubril from a uh, mixed farm in the Bigger Saskatchewan, and Derek and I will be talking about precision egg and it cropping. <laughs> Okay, so we're going to ask that you guys keep your questions until the very end, and we'll do our best to answer them then. As well as anyone sitting near the microphone, please don't say anything you wouldn't want your grandma to hear, because we are kind of live on YouTube, and I'm sure people's parents are watching. Soil health and plant pests. So, Festuca rubra is the Latin name for creeping red fescue. It's a perennial grass, meaning that the life cycle is going to take more than one year to complete. It's a shorter plant. It only grows about 15 to 90 centimeters tall, and it spreads by rhizomes, which Keegan will touch a little bit more on. Key feature of this fine grass is that the leaves are red at the base, unlike other grasses. That's why it's called creeping red fescue. So the root system. Uh, it's a creeping root system with a very dense, fibrous root besides that. <laughs> The root system has short but strong rhizomes. So a rhizome is basically just a plant stem underneath the ground that can produce a new plant with a new shoot and root system. So the benefits of soil health, so your perennial crops are in the ground for almost double the time of your annual crops, which allows for more soil biota to build up, allowing for a more consistent and predictable nutrient release. Uh, you also have more roots in the ground all year long, which reduces erosion. So benefits to soil structure. And your A horizon and your B horizon will be broken up by the fibrous root system. Your A horizon will turn into a granular, so that's perfect for water infiltration and water holding capacity. As well as your B horizon will be broken up from columnar to blocky, which allows for greater infiltration and water holding capacity. So ideal soil type and fertility. So generally these are grown in the gray wooded or black soil zones. Uh, these are ideal because you get large amounts of rain in the start of the spring where when the crop begins its growth. Uh, you can also grow this in low pH soils, which is a benefit because if you have a quarter with low pH, you can plant this, it'll grow well and reverse the effects of low pH. So this is the first um, pest of the creeping red fescue. This is a chinch bug. It will feed on wheat, barley, corn, and most turf grasses. They, life, or they overwinter as adults or mature nymphs, and we can identify the adults by having a red or a X on the back of their abdomen, along with these red legs, and because they're part of the hemopteran order, they have a very distinct red B on the back of their abdomen there, too. The uh, nymphs start off as having a white band across their abdomen until about the fifth instar, and then it starts to develop into the X on their back. The cinch bugs will pierce the leaf tissue to get out the contents, which will disrupt water flow in the leaf, and it will cause yellowing or browning of the leaf, and then it will die back. 
This usually looks like some patchy spots in your field. And then some beneficial insects that will keep the chinch bug under control is the big-eyed bug and the damsel bug. The wireworm is another predator or pest of our creeping red fescue, except it's going to feed on all field crops. I'm sure all of you know a little bit about the wireworm. So to identify the adult, they will usually make a clicking noise when they are flipped onto their back and trying to flip over, which is why they're called the click beetle. And they will also play dead if they're disturbed, so that's another good way to tell. Along with the head and thorax look like they're just in one spot instead of three separate segments. <laughs> For the larva, they're just these orange wiry cylinder larva, and they'll just hang out a few centimeters underneath the soil. The new adults and larva will overwinter, except depending on the species, they can overwinter, or sorry, they can be in the larval stage for 4 to 11 years, which is why it can be really difficult to get control of these guys. The damage, because they will feed on germinating seeds, as the seed's giving off carbon dioxide as it's trying to grow, the wireworms are actually attracted to that, so they will feed on those seeds, leaving poor emergent spots, bare spots, and stuff like that. And then some beneficials are the ground beetle up top there, and then the rove beetle in the bottom right, and the larva of stiletto flies. Glassy cutworms are just like any other cutworm, feed on most grasses, occasionally on corn and cereals. For the adults, they are kind of brownish black, and they have the black dots near the ends of their wings. The larvae are very shiny. No real markings, except they have a very distinct reddish head and red neck shield. These guys will, their outbreaks will last two to three years, which is basically the growth, growth cycle for the creeping red fescue. So it can be really difficult to get control of these guys while they're out. Since they are a cutworm, they will feed on the plant crown and the roots, chopping that off. So again, you're going to have some bare spots and some bare patches out there. Parasitic wasp and tanchid <laughs> flies will feed on them, along with your other predators such as like mice and birds, things like that. First disease we're going to talk about is stem eye spot. It creates lesions on the stem and the leaves. Uh, the, it can lead to 50% seed loss in fescue. Uh, the best way to deal with this is to bale your <coughs> residues, as that's where the pathogens overwinter. <laughs> Second one we're going to talk about is uh, root rot and seedling blight called Drechlera. Uh, if you have this in your soil, I wouldn't recommend growing creeping red fescue because your seedlings will die before you establish a plant stand. And the last two are crown rust and pink snow mold. So crown rust gets blown up every year from the U.S. rust belt down, down in Kansas and Oklahoma, and it'll infect a whole bunch of crops along the way. The rust lesions are yellow and they'll just stick right onto the leaves. They look like any other rust you would find on your vehicle or something like that. They usually it's too late to once you get it that it won't usually influence your yield, so won't won't really be a problem. The pink snow mold will over summer in crop residue and in seed. So when that happens, after that everything underneath it will be winter kill and nothing will be usable. So yeah, those are some of the insects and diseases and plant health we come up with. And now we will call on the agronomy and production <laughs> group. Alrighty, so for going over agronomy and production, um, we'll be starting with our pre-seed and seeding practices, and then we'll be moving into in-crops, weeds, insects, and diseases that are prevalent and how to um, scout for them. And then Ray will be talking about our harvest and post-harvest practices. So variety selection um, for certified seed, 10 to 20% of production um, is the certified, and it is grown from foundation seed, and this seed is inspected by the Canadian Seed Growers Association after heading and before harvest um, to look for off types. And it is important to note that the isolation distance is 50 meters um, between the, your field of 
certified um, fescue and any other similar crop types to um, <coughs> reduce the risk of cross-pollination. So common seed can be grown from certified or common seed, and the most common variety is boreal um, because of its pasture grazing abilities. As you can see here, um, we chose the Brett Young Boreal variety um, because of its ability to grow over a multitude of soil types. Um, as you can see, it's the pH is from 5.5 to 7.5, so that's quite a big range um, that can cover a lot of soil. And then acidity and alkalinity is also moderate to high, and salinity is low to moderate, also covering a whole bunch of different soil types. Uh, field selection. It's important that you are going into this um, with um, little to no weed competition as the fescue getting started um, is not the most competitive crop. So making sure that your um, field is free of perennial weeds is crucial. Um, planting fescue after canola can also benefit um, because the canola can protect um, your little seedlings as they get started. And prior field herbicide usage is also highly important um, because obviously your fescue seedlings um, can be harmed by the residual effects. So when it comes to seeding creeping red fescue, it should not be seeded any later than June 15th, so you have enough time for it to get established. Uh, it should not be seeded into wheat stubble due to volunteer and grassy weed issues. Uh, if you're going for a one year of production in your stand, you're going to shoot for around five pounds an acre. If you're going for two years or more, it'll be between one and three pounds per acre. Uh, row spacing, all typical row spacing from air drills works. Or you can also broadcast and pack your seed on, as long as it has seed soil con contact, it will germinate. Weeds can be a problem in every field, although the most problematic weeds in fescue are wild oats and crop grass. Wild oat is an annual weed and is considered the most problematic grassy weed in Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Manitoba. The reason they are such a problem is that they can be resistant to groups 1, 2, 8, and 15 herbicides. And uh, quack grass is a perennial grass and it's difficult to control because of their rhizomes, they spread very quickly from them, and it has allelopathic properties, meaning the rhizomes spread toxic substances that uh, can suppress other plants' growth. The following herbicides are registered for in-crop management in creeping red fescue. Some broadleaf options are Bactril M, Refine SG, and Infinity. Some grassy options are Assure 2 and Post Ultra. As there are very little grassy herbicide options for this crop, it is highly beneficial to control these weeds before seeding. It is also recommended to look at a crop protection guide or talk to retail before applying some of these herbicides as they have grazing restrictions and should only be used in seed production. Scouting fescue. Scouting fescue is a little bit more challenging than our regular cereals as there was very little information on how to accurately scout it, although it does go through several stages. The first stage is seed germination, and then there is a juvenile stage where the growing points are developed. This occurs in the spring and summer. Then in the fall or early winter, there is a process that is called primary induction that occurs. This is the plant's response to low temperatures where the tillers become reproductive. Then there is a secondary induction where it is essentially the initiation of flowering. <coughs> Temperature affects this as it needs to be between 6 and 15 degrees Celsius for a period of 12 to 20 weeks. After this, the seed heads develop and they can be found as, the early, as early as the end of April. And then once that occurs, there is the, <coughs> excuse me, then anthesis occurs once the flowers have fully developed. And uh, the pollination is peaked at the middle of the day. Factors that can affect 
The rate of pollination is humidity and rainfall, and this can also extend the length of anthesis. Scouting and monitoring for insects and diseases. Another insect that can affect fescue is grasshoppers. When we are scouting insects, we want to consider their life cycle and biology, as they all have different scouting methods. If you're scouting grasshoppers, for example, and you are in the field, start in the corner of the field and make your way towards the center of the field, making sure nymphs and adults are counted. Greater than 24 per square meter is considered very severe. Scouting methods can be found online or in insect books. Then when we are scouting for diseases, we look for the visual symptoms to determine the disease type. After this, we are able to evaluate the damage to the plant and to the entire field to determine if fungicide application would be successful at preventing further yield loss. When we are looking for monitoring tools, they can be found online when searching insect population forecasts. So when it comes to the harvest of creeping red fescue, it's typically swathed and then picked up to combine. Uh, if you're trying to figure out your swath timing, what you do is you grab a handful of creeping, ves creeping red <coughs> fescue and you're going to hit it on your hand a few times and when you start to get some shelling out when you do that, it's time to go swath it. <coughs> and you want to make sure your cutter bar is in good shape because the fine leaves and stems can be tough to cut. And one to two weeks later, you're going to roll through with the combine. Uh, harvest moisture is typically between 17 and 18 percent. is safe long-term moisture at 12 and a half percent. Most people use aeration to dry down their fescue. Uh, combine settings, so you're going to want to have a low rotor speed and a slow fan speed, as well as pretty wide concave spacing. Make sure you're gentle on the crop. Dockage in fescue is typically around 20%, and lower dockage might be a sign of overthreshing. So, residue management. The best way to deal with your residue is to bale it and remove it immediately after harvesting. If you don't want to bale your straw, you can spread it, and but <coughs> you will have some more disease issues, as Keegan said and you might lose some yield because you won't have as much light getting to the young new tillers down below. Uh, feed value of creeping red fescue straw is typically greater than fescue straw but less than grass hay so it can be great to add to your rations. Fescue straw should be tested for endophytes before feeding and mixed off if needed to avoid endophyte poisoning. When it comes to terminating the plant stand, Fall is going to be the best time to do this, just so you can, when the plant is bringing nutrients down to its roots, so you can kill the whole stand. You can try to spray it at other times, but you will have regrowth. Now we'd like to invite our broadcasting. Good evening, everybody. It's a, it's a quick question. Who here has done a broadcast application for in their fields? Nice. Good job. Okay. Perfect. <laughs> so uh, we'll get into that about broadcasting in red fescue. Here we have two different types of uh, broadcasting methods. On the left here we have a floater and on the right a spin spreader. Uh, both distribute uh, the fertilizer the same. Two different types of methods. Uh, timing. When should we do an application? Well, I'll tell you when we shouldn't. Uh, <laughs> we shouldn't apply on snow or covered uh, frozen ground. Uh, you want to do your application in uh, late October before that. Uh, the reason being, uh, urea needs that soil uh, penetration from uh, moisture and rain just so you uh, reduce the risk of gassing off and leaching. Uh, rates. Uh, your rates will vary between your fields, um, just uh, due to your nutrient levels from field to field. Uh, research shows that 60 pounds per acre is optimal, 
Uh, they did other trials were up to like 100 pounds, but there was no further yield increase after 60 pounds. Um, so that leads us to our next question. Ammonium nitrate or urea? Well, ammonium nitrate is so good, it's the bomb. <laughs> so we can't use that anymore, so we have urea. <laughs> Glad you guys got that one. Uh, here we have a chart that shows uh, the fall timing with your broadcasting as the lowest yield at uh, 531 pounds per acre. And when you do your late spring application, is the lowest at 497 pounds per acre. So, ESN. ESN is environmentally safe nitrogen. Um, it's surrounded by a water permeable coat. Uh, it's like a plastic outing that once moisture hits the, uh, the shell, it will slowly release the nutrients into the soil. Uh, one thing to be careful with ESN is overhandling it. Uh, overhandling it will kind of deteriorate that plastic coating, making it less effective. So why use an ESN? Uh, you reduce the gassing off in the soil and volatilization, so it's better for the environment that way. Also, treated fertilizer is another benefit to the environment. Uh, Helps with the release and timing. Also uh, reduces gassing off. Um, another benefit for all crops, um, not just red fescues, that you might be able to see it a little bit close to the seed without the risk of seed burn. Advantages. So we can apply a little bit larger rates, um, reduce the air seeder capacity, and you can increase your yield. Disadvantages, um, you're looking at a little bit higher cost just because of the use of, uh, if you don't have a floater or a spin spreader, custom rates, uh, the cost of treated seeds a little bit higher, and the risk of gassing off. So you might lose uh, 5 to 10% due to volatilization and leaching. Um, it's not as accurate compared to your banding with your drill. Um, banding secures the, the fertilizer rate to where the seed and that's all I have for broadcasting in Red Fesky. Next we have grazing. Um, so coming from a mixed farm operation, I wanted to see how I can not only incorporate creeping red fescue into a crop rotation, but how I could also incorporate into my cow and calf operation as well. So does this work for grazing? <coughs> Creeping red fescue is a persistent crop because it is a one to three year growth period. Um, it is palatable for cows, even though, <coughs> sorry, okay. There's an internal fungus called an endophyte. This is toxic to cattle in the summer months. Um, this is, causes an actual blood flow lack to their hooves, which in the winter months can cause their feet to fall off. Um, it's a lot more per prominent in tall fescue. There's only three cultivators that have recently been in um, creeping red fescue. It's best for late fall or dormant grazing, just because during those summer months, that's when the endophyte is at its highest. Um, it holds its feed quality really well throughout the season, and it creates this tough sward in pastures. Just because creeping red fescue grows in a lot of places that your typical grasses don't, it grows well in damp, darker conditions. Where, cause as it, the creeping rhizomes can reach into those moisture, um, more droughty areas. Um, so this was a trial that was done on grazing steers, on just the creeping red fescue um, crop alone. I wouldn't recommend doing grazing cows on just creeping red fescue, just because the nutrient levels aren't very high in the grass. Um, so for more of a cow-calf operation, I would look at blending creeping red fescue into other grassy blends. Um, so the hypothesis with this grazing trial was that a moderate grazing would probably um, have the lowest yield loss, but it actually turns out that heavy grazing causes the least yield loss at only 8%, and this is from when the seed is harvested to when the ground freezes. So in between these periods of harvest to freezing is when it's best to graze your cattle on it. Um, spring grazing and uh, fall grazing isn't a best option just because you're losing 35% of your yield. Um, some tips and tricks on working with fescue and some of the feed. So you can get two to three cuts 
of hay for your fescue. That's depending on your growing season. Um, it's best to move your fence two to three acres at a time. This just is allows the crop to regrow and reestablish itself. And it also works best with a rotational grazing. Um, so it can be used to graze, although I wouldn't recommend grazing on fescue alone, like I said earlier. Um, I would mix it in with other grasses just because it's a really hardy, uh, persistent grass. Um, other varieties are more suitable, so your tall fescue, your boreal varieties and it helps strengthen your pastures. And that's all. Now for the finance and marketing team. I'm gonna be using two different partial budgets to show the difference between growing red fescue, wheat, and canola. So first off, I'm going to do the wheat and versus the fescue. Per acre, if you're getting about 79.5 bushels an acre for wheat at $7.08, you're going to end up with a revenue of $620. Expenses, I looked at fuel, seed, fertilizer, and pesticides. Just try to keep it a little bit more simple. That came out at $246.78. Moving on to the fescue. Per acre, a crop averages about 900 pounds per acre at $1.50 a pound, coming at $1,350 for revenue. Expenses, they're about the same as the wheat, but I added a mowing expense and an establishment year expense, coming out at $533.50. Now here you can see that the best option would be to choose the creeping red fescue, and the financial advantage is $443.18. Next, I'm going to compare canola and fescue. <coughs> now, I dropped the prices quite a bit just to show you so you can make break even. For canola, if you average around 41.3 bushels an acre, you can get, and you get $11.50 per bushel. That comes out at $589.00 and 95 cents for revenue. Expenses are the same as the wheat. That came out at $308. Red fescue, I dropped the price down to 50 cents per pound, and that came out at $450. <coughs> same expenses I looked at, and this, this time it came out at $442.12. Here you can see that the canola is obviously the better option to grow at a financial advantage of $274.06. So over the course of the semester, I spent time calling different retailers and they told me that there's four different ways you can market your fescue, which is obviously you can do the ca uh, cash market, you could do production contracts, deferred delivery, and brokered seed. But none of them ever had historical prices except for the Prairie River Forage Association and the government of Alberta. The blue line you can see here is fescue compared to your smooth brome, your alpha alpha, and your timothy grass. And this dates all the way back to 1970. And fescue hasn't, in the past, you haven't, hasn't been the most money. But over these past couple of years, it's been increased. And I'll show you in the next slide. Back in 2014, all the way up to at least 2018, it's hovered around a underneath a dollar. But these past couple of years, it's trot up to $1.50 to $2. And that can be attributed to two reasons. Mostly due in the Peace River area, they haven't had the best production. Yields haven't been the greatest. Just not the best farming season. And another reason is the increase in the canola acres in the area. Especially when canola goes up to $20 an uh, acre. Uh, everyone wants to grow that. No one really wants to grow fescue, so obviously the price of fescue is going to go up as well since no one's growing it. Now, is there a trend to the fescue price? There isn't. You can't accurately predict this product. It's too volatile. It's often subject to the weather conditions in the area and the consumer need for the product. For example, at a retail in 2018, just because of the poor year, their price shot up 90 cents per your best way to market fescue, <coughs> most growers grow with common seed, so you can just do a, open contracts with any annuals that you grow. And only growers with certified seed will get production contracts, and that's based upon a set of 
a set price between the buyer and the uh, producer. Next, we'll call up precision egg and intercropping. <coughs> All right, good news is, is we're the last two to talk. So, you guys have almost made it far all the way through. Um, I'm Derek. I'll be talking about Precision Ag. Uh, essentially, so this is practicum speech. So, I worked for a Precision Ag company this past summer. Uh, I built maps and helped variable rate prescriptions. So, essentially, the best way to utilize fescue when using Precision Ag is to intercrop. So, intercrop or nurse crop talk about it. Um, anyways, fescue has a lot of parameters uh, that are tough to come by, so precision ag helps, um, I guess, meet these parameters. Um, so fescue takes two years when black seeded and three years um, when intercrop to produce a yield. Um, unlike normal cereal crops, though, like barley or wheat, fescue needs to have less than less plants per foot squared in tougher, sandier soils so that it can grow from the rhizomes. Um, by making maps, such as this, um, you can determine which areas of your field it's tougher to grow, so then you can actually plant less per square foot. So, also another way we can utilize precision egg, especially when intercropping, is by using systems like RTK. So this allows us to seed between the rows, and what this does is it doesn't affect our seed bed for the cash crop. So, there's that, and as I mentioned earlier, as Austin mentioned earlier about broadcasting and uh, different rates for your field for your fertilizer, uh, you can change your rate as you cross through different parts of your field. So, um, if it's really sandy and not good here, and you need to put more sulfur down or more uh, nitrogen down as compared to these better areas, you could do that. And that is the advantage of precision ag. So intercropping. So the role of intercropping is the process of growing two or more crops in the same field, producing higher yields, and utilizing the entire field. Um, that's all I have for that. So I'll tell you a little bit of, of the advantages. So a couple of the advantages would be soil health. You, we are preventing your soil erosion. And we are increasing your soil organic matter by in we're increasing so soil organic matter because we do have twice the amount of roots in the soil as we would in a singular monocropping culture. Twice the amount of roots equals twice the amount of decomposition of the roots, which does increase your soil organic matter. We do also see a reduced application of fertilizer and also an increased overall average yield between the two crops. There is also an increased control of weeds between the two crops. Uh, disadvantage, it is time consuming. You do need two passes in your field. One pass to seed your first crop and your second pass, your second pass to seed your second crop. And there, you do also need an RTK system, as Derek mentioned, to seed in between your first uh, crop so you're not disturbing the seed bed. It does require some precise planning for different cultivar and variety selections. And also your in-crop herbicides may be limited to different groups and modes of actions. So in a winter wheat and fescue intercropping practice, both crops do have the ability to grow in cooler conditions. Fescue is a two to three season crop. So if you were to intercrop it with uh, winter wheat, you would need to seed your fescue one season prior to seeding your winter wheat. And you can harvest your intercrop in two different ways. One for hay production, and so for hay production, you would cut or mow your crop when your winter wheat is at soft dough stage and your fescue is at booting. You'd then let the hay dry and then be baled. For cutting it for seed production, you would harvest it with your winter wheat at uh, fully mature and your fescue seeds being brown. This Intercropping practice is also excellent for forage crop and grazing. It is rich in nutrients and it does extend your grazing period all, se all season long. Okay, nurse and companion cropping. 
So this is very much like intercropping, but however, the second crop, such as fescue, will aid in protecting the main cash crop from uh, pests, uh, weed pressures, um, and it will promote growth. So actually, it, it helps maintain moisture within the soil. So um, also, after you've processed your cash crop, following year after you can use the uh, nurse crop which would be fescue as a silage so it's it does go to profit somehow so nurse cropping corn and fescue together is it's really good corn is very susceptible to weed growth and soil erosion and uh, fescue and corn both have deep roots that do penetrate in the soil to bring up any excess nitrogen that has leached into the soil but we do uh, we do see the fescue in between your corn rows because corn rows are they're very far apart so nitrogen does get leached in between the rows that the roots of the corn cannot reach so that's what the fescue is for it's for taking up that nitrogen that so it doesn't leach down into the soil and be uh, leached off by groundwater uh, it does improve your water retention and nutrient holding uh, capacity. We do see reduced leaching up to 40% nurse crop in your fescue with your corn. Also another factor to help reduce your leaching is it does provide ground coverage in sandy soils with high amounts of rain and moisture in sandy soils. Your sandy soils do have limited water and nutrient holding capacity so the ground coverage does, uh, does Give some, give some retention to that sandy soils. And that is all we have, so we'd like to call up the rest of our group for any questions you guys have. Please hold your applause for later. I know that uh, it's probably gonna be a standing O, so please. <coughs> yeah, we'll shuffle down here. So if you have any questions, we'd like to invite you to ask them now. <laughs> Unless they're on Janet's sheet, then we don't know. Oh, Ashton's got one. All right, so in most mixed blends, what percentage actually can you you? Like, oh, I don't know that specifically, but like, like when you buy a blend, like usually you're not buying it because it's already out in your pastures already like it's a lot of that grass that you'll find in like your damp areas and your swampy areas on the edge of the trees that sort of stuff Marcy. after doing all this research would you suggest it for the smf it's probably actually not that bad <laughs> <laughs> yeah like it could totally help out with your if you guys have any acidic soil or soils or salty soils that you have and then you could put some of that for the cows too. So I think it might not be the worst option, but it depends. Uh, Google probably does. <laughs> <laughs> Especially if you were removing your residue, you would use up quite a bit of phosphorus over time. Mm -hmm. Alex. So you mentioned a few times that it has a very deep fibrous root system. Um, do you know how deep that root system is? And because it's fibrous, does that have the strength to break through a hard pan? Yes. <laughs> I don't know about a hard pan, but it does break through your A and B horizons pretty well. So I don't know now, but I can reach you at the end of class and get back to you, <laughs> get back to you at the end of this. Oh, damn. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my question is for Kelly. Um, in your projections, how did you come up with your pricing and why did you use the pricing you did versus current market values? I thought it was very good to see at a market low and at an average market rather than a market high. You're always going to make a profit at a high, so I think thought this would just be more beneficial in learning. Janet. Tara, this is a question for oh, you. No. <laughs> you said that Fescue is a poor competitor, but yet you, you said that you should plant it after canola because canola
Well, we'll shelter you or something. Could mm -hmm. you explain that to me a little more, please? It's just because, like, your stubble from your canola is usually cut, like, a little bit higher, and then it has, like, obviously the stronger stalks. So, like, it'll have the ability to help, like, create a better protection, whereas, like, your wheat stubble and your barley stubble isn't as strong. And so it'll just help create a better environment for your little fescue seedlings to get started. Even though canola is notoriously volunteer? Yep. <laughs> yes, <laughs> everything is. <laughs> It's a broad leaf, so you could spray it out if it was an issue at the end of the day. Yeah. It's a bit more tricky with their wheat or volunteer barley. And it's only a bad competitor up until it establishes. Because once it has a thick root system, there's not much growing through that. Yeah. What's the current price of Cur the SQC? The current price? They're $1.50. For both common and certified? Uh, when I ask for common. Okay. That's per pound. Yes. Yeah, Ashton again. <laughs> Real time tomatic system. So essentially, it's, uh, it's just a really good GPS system that can guidance your tractor to understand. Like, you can have a lag time on it. So if you cross over into a different zone of your field, then it can switch your rates on your tank or on your broadcaster or sprayer. Or Yeah, typically grown yeah. in the peace country because we just get that long daylight really early so we can get it to head out early and harvest it before the small grains are ready. Okay, no, like in Alberta? That's yeah. the primary? And so other provinces aren't really picking up on it? Not as much. There's some more southern, I think it's southern Alberta and Saskatchewan under irrigation, but mostly peace country. Okay. Austin, can you buy a more nitrate? <laughs> <laughs> uh, illegally, probably. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't. <laughs> all right, well then we'd like to thank you all for coming, joining us, and thanks everyone for watching. Hey, Mom. <laughs> <laughs>